loud voice announcement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who are you? I'm Jen Buchholz. I am an Army veteran. I'm professor of forensics and criminal justice at American Military University. I'm also an advisor for the university's cold case team, and I'm a licensed private investigator. Uh, my name is George Jared. I'm an investigative journalist and a true crime author. I've written three true crime books. I covered uh, the West Memphis Three case for many years. I, uh, I wrote probably more, uh, not probably, I wrote more uh, journalism stories about the West Memphis Three case than anybody in the world. I interviewed Damien Eccles when he was still on death row uh, before he got released. And I also broke the story when they got released from prison back in 2011. Uh, yeah. Uh, Rebecca's case was the first case that I ever covered, and I was actually out there the day they found her body. Um, is my mic working? Okay. All right. Can you hear you? Better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, before we get going today, no, I've got feedback. We're gonna have. A, we're gonna show you a message from Rebecca's father, Dr. Larry Gold. So, in retrospect, and thinking back about my daughter, Rebecca Gould, I, uh, I searched my memory because when she was murdered, she was only 22 years old, and so she had her entire life ahead of her. I don't have memories of marriages or children or graduations from the university, all the things that I know that Rebecca would have accomplished. The memories that I do have of Rebecca that are distinguished um, in my mind and etched in my mind forever. Uh, a couple funny ones, a uh, couple that maybe as a parent you can laugh at with me, and that's simply that she was a, she was a rebel. I mean, she really had her own mind. She, you might tell her to do something, and she wouldn't do it. She would, uh, she would really do her own thing. And at the time as a parent, that might upset you a little bit because you want your kids to behave. But now when I think about it, it was a real strength. And as she matured and, and got into her teenage years and, and then even uh, graduation from high school, I think all of her friends that I got to know after her murder really had such a high opinion of, of the strengths that Rebecca had. And those strengths were the kind of strengths that, that don't take you down the wrong path. If you learn your lessons, they take you the right path. And, and I think uh, if I put together the very last memory I have of Rebecca, it's when she was at my home. We, she came there to talk to me. She wanted me to she wanted me to hear what she had to say. We were out on the, my back deck, um, and she, uh, uh, she was telling me about her, her future, what she wanted for herself, and uh, I'm very lucky in that I, I, I have this as my last memory, and that's simply that um, I'm able to look back on my daughter and have her make a statement to her dad, to me, and say she wanted to be uh, she wanted to be successful like me, and she wanted to uh, become some type of a professional. She wanted to go to college and finish, and then to get into either ophthalmology or um, I don't remember exactly now what she mentioned, but the gist of it was simply she wanted to make something of her life. And this is a girl that had tunnel vision herself. I think she was ready. I think she had uh, put behind her some little mistakes here and there that all kids make when they're teenagers. And I think she was full steam ahead, um, ready to move on with a life in a very positive way. I honestly believe that she would have been something very special had this not happened. Uh, so um, 
my voice is cracking a little bit because that's, that's my memory. So we're going to start today by talking a little bit about uh, the timeline of events that surrounded Rebecca Gould's uh, last days on Earth. Rebecca was talking on her cell phone with her mother in Mountain View, Arkansas on September 19th, 2004. Her and her mother were having a casual conversation and suddenly she realized that she was running out of minutes. So she told her mother, she said, her mother's name is Shirley, she said, I'll call you back when I get more minutes. It's a phone call that Shirley Ballard never received. She was reported missing by her family on September 21st, 2004, which was a Tuesday. Although she was reported missing on Tuesday, there's reason to believe that she may have actually disappeared Sunday night. So kind of the timeline of what happened is, so she was talking to her mother at the grocery store, and then the next day she allegedly dropped a love interest named Casey McCullough off at work at the local Sonic in Melbourne, Arkansas, which is a short distance from Mountain View. Her and Casey had an on-again, off-again relationship. She was a college student in Northwest Arkansas and she would come back to the area on weekends to visit with friends and she actually stayed with him. So after she drops him off at work, she goes to a local convenience store called the Possum Trot and buys a few items. When she gets done buying, she talks to the clerk and when she gets done buying those items, she goes back to Casey's house. I've actually communicated with the clerk and she's not sure if she saw her on Sunday morning or Monday morning and to this day we still are not clear about that fact. So she goes back to his house, and she's collecting her things, um, her clothes, her Pomeranian dog lady, and, um, and she's going to go pick up her sister Danielle, and they're going to go back to northwest Arkansas that afternoon. Well, she never arrived to pick up Danielle. Danielle started calling around friends, family, trying to figure out where uh, Rebecca was at. One person that she repeatedly called that day and night was Casey McCullough, and he never answered her phone calls. So Casey is at work, and he leaves from work with friends, and he goes to a nearby town called Batesville to watch a movie and go to dinner. He, it was strange because he never did anything like this before. His friends said he was very reclusive. He didn't hang out with people like that. So he goes there, and, and also I need to add this detail in right now. So he didn't have a vehicle. Uh, his truck was actually in Batesville. His father was a long-haul truck driver, and so he had taken the vehicle to Batesville, and then Casey was supposed to go there and pick it up. What's interesting is that he didn't go home that day or night to change his clothes after work, even though he drove within a couple of miles of his own home. When he came home that night from the movie, he didn't actually go to his house, even though he had a dog that lived in the house. He went straight to a friend's house and stayed the night. He never went home to get clothes. He never did any of that. The next morning, he went from the friend's house back to work again. It's here that he says that he, um, that he found out that she was missing, and so he left work, and he conveniently ran into the police officer who had been called at this point on the Tuesday morning, who was going actually to his house to do the welfare check. So they go to the house to do the welfare check, and they find ominous things. There were bloody sheets in the washing machine. There was blood strewn through the house. Her dog, Lady, was there unharmed. Her car was there, her keys were there, her clothes were there. Everything was there except for her. Now, my involvement of this case started um, the Wednesday. So we start Monday, she's allegedly at the Possum Trot. Tuesday is when she's reported missing Wednesday. And on that Wednesday, her mother actually handed me this missing poster. And you can still see the notes I took, and this is before her body was ever found. So they spent uh, a week looking for her body, and then finally on September 27, 2004, um, they found um, her body down an embankment. Um, you've got uh, this, the town of Melbourne, Mountain View, and there's a thoroughfare that connects them called uh, Highway 9. She was found down an embankment about 35 feet down. There's an ancient gravel road that actually connects from very near Casey's house to where her body was found, so it's likely her killer took that route. Casey was identified as a person of interest in the case, and I was actually at the sheriff's department the day that he was brought in for questioning. I watched them take him in. Um, when she was found, she was only wearing a T-shirt and panties. He was interrogated, um, and he's been questioned through the years, but he has never been identified as a, as a suspect. And one important detail that I'd like to add is that 
the killer or killers cleaned the house. They put the uh, bedding in the washing machine and they cleaned up the house and they removed her body. The imagery here shows the location of the murder scene, Casey's trailer, in relation to the disposal site where Rebecca's body was found. When I first reached out to George over two years ago, I told him immediately that there had been three things that caught my attention when looking at the case. One is that the, the killer took the immense risk and time to mo remove Rebecca's body from the house to a secondary location. Two is that someone made an attempt to clean that crime scene. And three, a piano leg was reported to have been the object used to bludgeon Rebecca to death. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about piano legs in a little while. As most of you probably know, taking the time to move a body and clean a crime scene incurs an immense risk, and most killers don't take that risk or the time to do it. The most common action right after the, a murder is for the killer to grab the weapon, flee the scene, and leave the victim where she fell. And so knowing that somebody took this immense risk and spent the extra time at the scene and with the body, it indicated to us that Rebecca's killer had a known personal connection to both her and Casey's residence. Otherwise, what's the point of taking that immense risk? But I felt that those behavioral clues had been overlooked or just simply ignored by investigators over the years. So the disposal site is southwest of the town of Melbourne, and Casey's trailer is southeast. But as the crow flies, it's about eight miles between the two locations. And like George said, there are back roads that connect the two locations almost directly. Just for future reference, or for present reference, these are, uh, this is the Sonic, the gas station, the crime scene, and the disposal site. So um, I told you guys at the beginning, this was the first murder case I ever covered. It, um, it's just been a part of me for uh, a long time. And then on November 7, 2020, uh, William Miller, Casey's first cousin, was arrested in Eugene, Oregon, and charged with first-degree murder. And that date's very important to me because it was actually my birthday. Uh, Miller had been in Oregon for approximately nine months. He had, him and his family had been buying, like they were, uh, he, he was living in the Philippines. He was like working on like uh, oil rigs overseas. And so um, he had married a woman in the Philippines. They had young children. They were living there. He'd been gone for many years. Well, he came back to Oregon pr just right before COVID started. His uh, brother Jeremy and mother Linda lived there. Um, and so he had been there for about eight or nine months. The police were able to develop, I, I guess, some leads that led them to him. So they go in, they start questioning him, and he allegedly uh, confessed to being culpable in her death. And I know what you're asking yourself, why did he kill her? Um, at the time of the murder, he was living in Texas, but his mother Linda and brother Jeremy were living in Guyon, just a couple of miles from Casey's house. And according to his partial uh, probable cause affidavit, and I use the the word partial because it is incomplete. He said that on the morning of the 20th, he went to Casey's house in an S10 pickup truck, which we've checked every register, uh, vehicle registration record we can. He didn't own an S10 pickup truck as far as I know. Casey did. He said that he hid an S10 pickup truck near Casey's house and that he went to the door, knocked on the door, came inside and pretended to talk on the phone for a while. And he continued this ruse, and then she went back into the other room. Now, I remind you again, when she was found, she was wearing a T-shirt and panties, so we have to assume that that's what she was wearing when she was around this guy, according to his story. So then at some point, he says he goes and he retrieves the loose piano leg, and then he goes in there and he hits her a couple of times and he kills her. No motive is given. Um, and we, we cannot definitively say that she wasn't sexually assaulted, but there was no semen found on her in her. There were no foreign pubic hairs found um, that we know of. And there was no, none of the like telltale signs of a sexual assault, you know, like the bruising that you would expect to find on sexual organs and things like that. She had none of that. So, um, and also, like I said, she was wearing her panties when she was found. Now, I will say this. Um, her body had decomposed so badly when they found her that when the medical examiner put her body in the bag, when they took her out at the lab, they had to reach back into the bag to grab her hair and pull it out. The images here show the two areas of injuries 
that Rebecca incurred based on the autopsy report. As you can see, there's two distinct and separate areas of injury, and we know that there were two blows to her head because there is no damage to her left eye socket or any of the skull area in between those two locations. So her killer hit her two times. <clears throat> the angle on both injuries is similar, and that provides us some insight into the stance and the location of the killer's hand when he hit her. The previous prevailing theory for many, many years was that Rebecca had been asleep in bed, somebody came in Casey's trailer and attacked her while she was sleeping. But in conducting hours and hours of recreation of these injuries, we were unable to recreate the injury with her laying down. She had to have been awake and upright and likely interacting with her killer prior to being hit. Also, our recreation indicates that she probably turned her back on the person because the only way we can recreate that damage to her nasal structure at that angle is if she had her back turned and either the killer grabbed her right arm, which instinctively led her to turn her head to the right, or somebody snuck up on her, she heard something and turned her head to the right, right into the incoming blow of the weapon. That is the only way we've been able to recreate that injury. And so that, in turn, gives us another clue that the person who hit her is probably someone she trusted, because if a woman is being threatened or an attempted assault is in place, she's not going to turn her back on that person. She also had a broken hyoid bone, and the most common cause of a broken hyoid bone in homicide victims is manual strangulation. So there's a good chance that William or somebody took their hand or hands and put the pressure on her neck, breaking that bone. So we mentioned a piano leg, and I actually acquired a piano leg to bring today. <laughs> Casey won't tell us the make and model of the piano that he owned, but he lived in a single wide trailer, so we know that it was a small upright piano. And so this leg is probably quite similar to the leg that was on his piano. Now, keep in mind that there's a lot of different shapes and styles of piano legs. They're not all square like this. And as George can attest, we have debated the piano leg theory to no end. Probably <laughs> about 40 last... hours worth of debating. <laughs> Even last night when we were rehearsing, we were debating it more. I have a hard time accepting that this object was the weapon, and I'll tell you why. The top part of this, and almost every piano leg out there, is too wide to be consistent with Rebecca's injuries. And the most, most natural way to swing a blunt object like this would be to grab it like a baseball bat at the skinnier end and swing the more heavy end at the person. Now, it's possible that the bottom skinnier part could be consistent with her injuries, but me personally, I don't think it's natural to grab an object and swing it like that. Um, George argues with me a little bit on that, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, I actually have a video uploaded on my YouTube channel that's about 10 minutes long that provides a lot more detail and recreation on Rebecca's injuries, so I'll give you the link to that later. And Please feel free to come find me after the presentation or anytime this weekend if you want to check out the leg and discuss it with me because I would love to get <laughs> more ideas on this. So back to Casey. Uh, statistically speaking, Casey would be a natural suspect in this case. He was a love interest. It was an on-again, off-again relationship. They actually met when they worked at the Sonic in Melbourne before she moved to Northwest Arkansas to go to school. Uh, Casey's behavior in relation to Rebecca's case has always been bizarre. Uh, he's made a few public comments about it, and he's always repeatedly told lies about things when he has spoken. So in June of 2005, um, I actually was able to track him down. I tried to get a hold of him a few times. I would call him on his cell phone. He would never respond. So I finally caught him at the Sonic, and I asked him exactly what had happened. And so um, he told me that uh, he was at work, the story that I told you guys, and that he ran into Charlie Melton, the deputy, who just happened to be driving down the road, and that they went to his house, which I knew when he told me this story in 2005 that it was a lie because that just didn't make any sense. Now, I did give him this caveat. When people are involved in a, in a high pressure, high stress situation like the murder of a friend or a girlfriend, it you, you, there is a thing, you can, your, your brain, your memories can get fogged. I understand that, you know, you might not quite remember every detail, but that one just didn't make any sense to me. Now, here's the problem. 
Casey did return to that trailer before he returned with the police officer. He told family and friends, he actually told people in the Gould family years later that he did return that morning on Tuesday, September 21st, before he went to work, before the call was made to the sheriff's department, that he did go back to his trailer. And, and I'll remind you, the bloody sheets, his own sheets from his own bed are in the washing machine. There are bloody pillows under his bed. His dog is there, her dog is there, her car is there, her clothes are there, her cell phone is there, her money's there, all of her personal effects are there. And he goes in, gets a clean shirt for work, and walks out the door and thinks nothing of it. Now, at first you think, okay, maybe he's absent-minded, maybe he's Mr. Magoo, maybe he doesn't notice all these things going on in his own freaking house. Here's the problem. He told two people that she was missing the day before. So, um, and I see Catherine Townsend over here. Um, and if anybody hasn't heard um, the Helen Gone podcast, it's brilliant, it's great. Um, she did an excellent job. So in 2018, when Catherine released her podcast, we started getting a lot of phone calls. The, this whole, the, the whole stress factor for this case just ramped up because it hadn't been solved. And so what happened is, is the uh, detective, Dennis Simons, who had been um, on this case for many years, um, he decided he was going to start re-interviewing suspects, or not suspects, um, excuse me, people who had given statements. So two of the people who gave statements were two friends that went with Casey that night when he went out to dinner and went to a movie. Well, for some reason, the detective in the case, and if there's any law enforcement people in here, I'd love to talk to you after this because I've never found one that can answer this. He sends those statements back to those people so they can freshen their memories, which is what you would never want to do. So they give the statements back, well, and Catherine can attest to this, within 24 hours, guess who has both of those statements emailed to them? Me and her. So when going through the statements, they said that at one point that night, Casey gets on someone else's phone, and remember I told you, Danielle's been calling him all night on his phone and he won't answer. He, calls some, he talks to somebody on the phone that night, and he gets off the phone and he tells these two friends, Philip and Laren, that she is missing. And in their statements, both of them say they could not believe that he wasn't running out the door to find her. And one, in one of the statements, it says that he was, quote unquote, obsessed with her. So that was very, damage, that was very damning to me. There was also a couple of other ancillary details that were kind of damning. Number one, he didn't go to her funeral. He claims that he did, but he didn't sign the book, and no one in the Gould family can place him actually there. He didn't help look for her the week that she was missing. His family claims that he was threatened. The problem with that statement is, is that Rebecca at the time had three petite, small sisters, very, you know, she's 5'1", her sisters are all the same size, very small girls, and her father was nearly 60 years old. I was there. I don't remember anybody threatening anybody. Her ex-boyfriend from high school was out there looking for her. So the question is, who did he talk to that night? Why did he lie about going home? Why didn't he even go home to even let his dog out for a second? Either trip. These are all questions that he refuses to answer. So I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've been very hard on Casey through the years. I've written about him a lot. I've gone after him. Um, so we actually decided to invite him to CrimeCon today. I sent him a message. And all expenses paid. Actually, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, a private benefactor offered him $10,000 to do a sit-down interview with Jennifer and I, and he refused. And by the way, he still, up until about a year ago, he still lived in the trailer where Rebecca was murdered with his wife and now his two young children. And they claimed that they didn't have enough money to, buy the, to get out of this trailer. And I said, well, the $10,000 would have gone a long way to get you out of there. So, and I'm going to be fair, um, I sent him a message, which I suspected he wouldn't answer. I also sent the same message to his wife, Hannah, and she did respond. And she was very nice. And he, he met Hannah many years after the fact. She has nothing to do with any of this. I, I, you know, I, I understand you know, that she is not, she's married to the guy. They have two kids together. 
She's obviously been told for years that he had nothing to do with this, so I, I get that. But she did respond. He did not. She said he's not on Facebook anymore, which I very much doubt. So um, also, I'll tell you a real quick story. So in 2016, I wrote my book about the West Memphis Three. I also included a chapter about Rebecca's case. I reconnected with Dr. Larry Gould. I sent, he always thought Casey knew something. And so I sent Casey a series of messages saying, or let me back up. I called the Sonic one day to try to figure out where he was at. I actually called the Sonic in Melbourne. And I said, do you guys know where Casey McCullough's at now? And they didn't know. His wife was in there eating dinner when I called. And the car hop goes, well, his wife is here. Do you want to talk to her? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> and so they put her on the phone. And she was a very sweet woman. Um, she said, he'd love to talk to you. I said, great, because I had interviewed him a couple times. I actually interviewed him one other time, and it, the conversation was so benign, I didn't even write a story about it. So she gave me his Facebook. She said, friend him on Facebook. She gave me his cell phone number. I called him, left messages, said, hey, we don't get a signal out there, the same trailer, and friend him on Facebook. Well, I sent him a series of Facebook messages. I sent him a series of uh, phone messages. To this day, he's never responded to any of them. So what I did is I called Hannah back. I had her cell phone number. She told me, this is just a couple days later, she said, don't call us, we don't want to talk to you, we don't want anything to do with you, leave us alone. Click. And at that point, I got suspicious. So uh, Jennifer and I started communicating in January of 2019, as she said, she sent me an email. Actually, that's how I met Catherine. She sent me an email, too. Um, and we started um, a Facebook page. I think it was in October, and October 14-ish, yeah. So on November 14th, you'll never guess who joined our Facebook page. William Miller, wow. the guy who's been charged with murder. So he postulated theories about how she died, the number of blows to her head. Um, he also postulated about rumors that the neighbors heard screaming that night. And then he also tried to insinuate that Casey and Rebecca were involved in some kind of love triangle, and this was a byproduct of... Um, that. And he also said that the thoroughfare that led to where her body was found, only a local would know that. So he was saying all this stuff. What's interesting is he, he private messaged me once or twice. We didn't really communicate a lot. But what he said to Jennifer in private messages was astonishing. Wow. I hope that wasn't me. of the case, looking for information, whatnot. Um, he went on to ask me, better? No? We're there. I'll just talk, keep talking loudly. I teach classes, so I'm pretty used to having to talk loudly. Um, <clears throat> okay, better? So, knowing from the very start that he was Casey's cousin, I was kind of curious how he'd respond to me and Podunk, Arkansas, that nobody's heard of, and all he said was the word podcast, which I assume referred to Catherine Townsend's Helen Gone podcast. I need one more hand. So, knowing he was Casey's cousin this whole time, I assumed he was probably trying to obtain inside information from me to pass to Casey, and so I had to keep that assumption in the back of my mind with everything I wrote to him. Um, I operated under the assumption that he was taking screenshots of our entire conversation and passing them to Casey, which he may well have. A few more messages here. Um, and we're going to put these up on our Facebook group later because I know that this is a lot to digest in this short amount of time, but you can check them out in more detail later on. But 
throughout our entire dialogue, multiple times he made claims of wanting justice for Rebecca. And he told me multiple times he thought I could solve the case. He even went so far as to express sympathy for her family having to go 16 years without any answers, without any arrest or resolution. I, <clears throat> he circled us back around to his original message about the neighbor hearing screams. So we circled back around to that at one point, and he actually gave me the name of the neighbor who used to live next door to Casey. And I had already established who that person was, but I thought it was really interesting that he figured it out, so he was obviously doing his research. And then uh, one of these other messages, this is the last one here, it shows I, I blocked out the neighbor's name because I'm not going to re reveal their name, but that, the last message there you see is where he's given me that neighbor's last name. And like I said, we'll put these up on our Facebook group later. <laughs> Wait, I have a fix for that. <laughs> That's okay, I'm too loud anyway. I don't even need a mic. Um, so the Arkansas State Police have had custody of this case almost from the beginning. They took custody of the case like the first week um, when she went missing. You know, they went a couple days without even acknowledging she was missing, and if you guys ever want to hear a funny, well, it's not funny, a personal story. I mean, I, I, the day that I found out she was missing, I went down there and just started blasting everybody at the Sheriff's Department out in the parking lot in front of everybody. And um, the, the, the thing that bothered me the most about her case was that they, did not, they didn't ask for outside assistance. You know, a family shouldn't have to wait 16, 17 years to get a case solved, especially when the girl who got murdered, it was the person who's been charged right now is the first cousin of the guy she was seeing off and on. How hard of a jump could that possibly be? And just, just, just to be clear about it, I've, I was saying this for years. I've said this to the detective who worked a case who snuck into a book signing of mine one time years ago, by the way. And the only reason he snuck in, he didn't buy a book. He just came in there to see what I knew about the case that I didn't put in the book. And I told him, I said, well, next time, don't sneak in here. I said, just call me and I'll tell you what I know. And so, well, and here's the thing. So we got a new detective on this case and he had it solved within eight or nine months. So apparently I was right about that. Um, and also a couple of other things, you know, they have not released all the, you know, like, so William Miller has been arrested. Everything that, le that, that led to the, the, war the warrant that led to his arrest, every bit of information they used that they go to a judge, every bit of that should be a public record now, and it's not. Because a judge sealed the case within an hour of me posting to Facebook that they had made an arrest in the case. They haven't even announced it yet. So um, anyway, the thing that bothers me is that that there have been no press conferences, there's been no updated information, and they've only released a version of the probable cause when that is a public document. And that doesn't belong to me as a journalist or a true crime author, that belongs to you as people, as, as citizens. So I think that that's a part of the system that needs to change. I got my own now, maybe. Rebecca's father went to great lengths over the 16 years before the arrest to try to get some kind of forward progress in his daughter's case. He spent a ridiculous amount of money on private investigators. He wrote countless letters to various law enforcement and government officials, requested meetings, all basically with very little response and no assistance. When I first met him and I realized the level of mishandling that was going on in this case, I told him I was gonna do everything I could think of to try to get some answers. And we were, when we ran out of options, we'd re regroup and come up with something else. So I actually reached out to Jim Fitzgerald I bet some of you know who that is. <laughs> FBI agent credited with catching the Unabomber. And he's a um, ling linguistics expert, forensic linguistics. So I reached out to him and he actually extended a very coveted invitation to the ASP to present Rebecca's case in front of the VDOC Society. And for those who aren't familiar with that society, it's a nonprofit group comprised of over 100 world-renowned experts in forensic science and law enforcement. Most agencies have to wait in a very long list and go through a lengthy application process to be able to present their case. Jim was willing to fast forward that process for us. I bet you can guess what happened. Nothing. The previous investigator turned down the offer saying they weren't going to present any of the case file to quote a bunch of civilians. So Dr. Gould and I went to the FBI in, the Little, Rock, in Little Rock. 
This is an exact replica of the binder of information that we gave to the FBI. You're welcome to come look through it after the presentation. We sat with them for over an hour. They were willing to assist, but couldn't take over jurisdiction of the case. Not surprisingly, the ASP never reached out and asked for their help. We also met with the Arkansas Lieutenant Governor. We reached out to the Arkansas Governor, the Attorney General, the Director of the ASP. Most of them never even answered us, and the one or two that did gave us no useful information. As all of you know, forensic technology has advanced greatly since 2004 when Rebecca was killed. So we offered up the funding to the ASP to re-examine her cell phone and her car, which is still in existence, to see if they could use new technology to uncover new evidence. Previous investigator told me they'd already done that in 2004. Knowing how much information was accruing on my laptop and how many people were reaching out to me confidentially, I offered to make the 12-hour trip to Arkansas and deliver the investigator my laptop. Without knowing the status of their investigation, I had no idea if I had information that would be helpful to them. Naturally, they didn't respond, didn't you know, respond to that offer. If they had, turns out, they would have found out I was having a dialogue with William Miller and they maybe could have exploited that to their advantage. So one of the most frustrating aspects of this case is that William Miller's, um, his name was in the case file for years. And the weekend in question, there were mysterious stories about a car with Texas license plates that were roaming the area. And then there was this. Miller's younger brother, Jeremy, was a student at the nearby Mount Pleasant School District. In the days following her disappearance, he and his mother, Linda, fled to Texas with William. This is very important because what we learned a short, uh, shortly before he was arrested. So let's fast forward to September of 2020. We started getting information that there were people at the school district who were very concerned back then that this had happened and that they actually talked to the police. Well, we know for a fact now that a couple of those people were interviewed by the police in late September. In early October, m members of the McCullough family were interviewed and then within a month, William Miller's arrested. So what that tells you is, is that the people who were at the school knew something was going on. And this is important because, like we said before, there was a new investigator on the case. He took it over right before COVID started. And in the summer of 2020, the McCulloughs and the Millers started buying and consolidating properties in Oregon and Arkansas. It's almost as if they were getting ready for something to happen because they knew someone was on to what was going on. Now, I've written about this case for newspapers for many years, and I included a chapter about this case in every true crime book I've written, all three of them. Uh, and we've mentioned Catherine's Helen Gone podcast. It shined a bright, incinerating hot light, a national spotlight on this case, which immeasurably helped it to move forward. And then Jennifer has written countless articles analyzing this case from every angle, and I'm gonna tell you right now, it is a dossier. I mean, if you wanna read about this case, that's who you need to read. <clears throat> now, I don't want to say, I don't want to speak ill of law enforcement. I think they do. A, I've got lots of friends who are detectives and work in law enforcement, so I'm never going to say anything bad about those guys. But, you know, in, in every profession, we get blinders, you know. I've had blinders. I've covered uh, probably two dozen murder cases, and, you know, I've been wrong sometimes about, well, actually, I've been wrong a lot of times. But I'm the first one to admit when I'm wrong, and I move on. You know, you if you can prove it to me, then I'm more than willing to accept that. And here's the thing. When a, when a guy like William Miller, whoever killed Rebecca, because we're not, and again, I want to make this very clear. Just because someone's been arrested for a murder doesn't mean they committed it. I have covered two other cases where someone was arrested and there was a confession. And those people are walking the streets free right now because they didn't do it. And so when a murderer is walking free, that is a hazard, that's a safety hazard to all of us. This is a picture of Rebecca's final resting spot. Not only should she be lying there at all, but she shouldn't have had to wait more than 16 years for answers and resolution in her case. As George touched on earlier, confirmation bias is completely not effective and this case is a classic example of why. And for those who aren't familiar with that term, confirmation bias happens when an investigator forms their own theory soon on into an investigation, 
and only wants to field information or evidence that supports that theory, while also ignoring evidence that might disprove the theory or point to other perpetrators. As George explained, a supervisor with the ASP allowed that investigator to mishandle the case for over 14 years. Apparently, no oversight, no accountability, no having a, you know annual meeting like, what's going on with this case? Where are you at? Nothing. And that's just a detrimental practice, and it sets a terrible example for new law enforcement officers. The Uniform Crime Report estimates that we have over 250,000 unsolved homicides in our country, and over a half million missing persons. Obviously, law enforcement doesn't have the resources to handle all of that, and that's not their fault. But whether they want help or not, they clearly need it. And so although we don't all carry a badge, there are countless citizens like everybody in this audience, like me and George, all of us, who have skills, who have knowledge, can help bring awareness to these cases and help find answers. Recently, we went to visit Rebecca at the cemetery, and we found Mike McNeil's business card on her headstone. Mike McNeil was the investigator assigned at the beginning of last year, and he gained an arrest in 10 months. So he had clearly traveled to visit Rebecca and leave her a short note apologizing. But in reality, he's most definitely not the one who should be apologizing to her. His gesture of traveling a couple hours from his office to go visit her, though, is a really good reminder that most law enforcement officers really do care and have empathy for their victims and the victims' families and the citizens that they serve. And so we have one more message for you today from Rebecca's father. The, the law enforcement officers that, to me, are truly the real professionals are the ones that reach out to the public and they ask for help. The ones that reach out and, and say uh, that, that they don't use their ego. They say, I'm the officer, I'm in charge of this case, help me. Now, there's somebody I respect. Um, and there's no reason to not be that way, especially nowadays. There's a lot of unsolved murders that the public can get involved with. There's a lot of the public that loves to get involved with these types of cases because they feel sincerely like they can help and that they can um, offer something, either the, the credentials or past law enforcement officers or people that are even current in, currently in law enforcement that have a particular skill to offer you. Why not reach out? It's just sheer stupidity not to. And there's no excuse not to. Because in all honesty, these are the people that know chain of evidence. They know how to take things and not reveal something. You know, they're just as skilled as you are, and probably even more so in many cases. And that's not to upstage you, that's simply to, to take... My daughter's case could have been solved the first month. On 16 years later. No victim's family member should have to go through that or be treated that way. Especially when the information was in the case file the entire time and the investigator ignored it. Rebecca's killer thought he silenced her forever and although she lost her life, she didn't lose her voice. And not only did she maintain her voice for her own justice, but she has maintained a voice for other victims of homicide and will continue to do so. She brought strangers together from around the country who never would have met otherwise. And some of those strangers are sitting together today in this audience for the very first time. She served as an inspiration for the establishment of the cold case team at American Military University. And she's had a profound impact on countless people and has led to a community of citizens who are standing up and demanding for oversight of, of investigators um, in, proper investigative practices and justice for all victims. As Paul Holes and Billy Jensen would say, and I'm sure you all know who they are, <laughs> it's time to get loud. Yeah, and they profiled this case too, by the way. So if you want to get involved, you have the QR code already to join our Facebook group. Please share it. Rebecca's case has been featured on more podcasts than I can even list on this slide, but these are the three main ones where you can get the most detailed information. Also, please, tomorrow, Catherine Townsend is going to be in breakout room number two at 2 p.m., 
and I imagine that there will be some more discussion and question and answer session on Rebecca's case. If anyone's interested in taking forensics classes or criminal justice classes, check out American Military University where I teach, and maybe we can collaborate together. And maybe Dennis days. Simons will take one of your classes. <laughs> you can reach out to me or George at either of these emails anytime. We always welcome people to reach out. If you want to just have a question, you want to discuss, brainstorm, whatever, totally fine. Follow me on Twitter. My YouTube handle is exactly the same. And so if you look up my YouTube handle under Jen Bukholz PI, you'll find that video on her injuries. Before we go into a short Q&A, I just want to remind everybody, or not remind you, but let you know, don't leave after these few questions that we're going to answer, because we have one final message for you. Anybody have questions? Hard to see you guys. No, he's never responded to me. The two times I've ever talked to him, I actually cornered him. I actually had to go to his work or call him on his cell phone. He didn't know who I was, or didn't uh, he didn't know who was calling. It's like really hard to see everybody. There's someone right up there. <laughs> Over here. That would be great. We'd love to chat with you. Come find us afterwards. Yeah. Right there. This is the thing we debate just as much as the piano leg, I think. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, there's so many scenarios that are still possible. And well, we the, the biggest problem that we have is that we don't have a motive for William Miller to kill her. We don't, we don't know of any relationship that they had. Up to this point, we're not, uh, she, she wasn't sexually assaulted that we know of. We don't know that it didn't happen, but she was wearing her undergarments. So we don't have any evidence for it. So again, 99% of the time when a woman is murdered, it is her husband, her boyfriend, or a love interest, or some connection to them. So why William Miller showed up on a random Monday morning to kill this girl for no reason at all? And it wasn't know. robbery because there was money left in her purse and other um, items of value that were not taken from the home. So I, I do think we can rule out robbery. Right. Yes, ma'am. I don't know if this is on or not. Um, just a question um, regarding the original investigator that had his ego and didn't want to admit that he was wrong and asked for help. Is he still practicing? Was there any ramifications for that? Um, he, as far as we know, he is still working for the uh, state police. You know, the funny thing is, as I told Dr. Gould in 2016, he asked me, he said, so what can we do to ensure that this case gets solved? And I told him, I said, look, and at this time, Dennis was still the investigator. I said, the only w method that I know of, and it worked in the West Memphis 3 case, the incinerating bright lights of media scrutiny, it works. Every case I've ever covered that got this kind of attention. When I wrote about Rebecca's case in 2016, I think two newspaper articles have been written about it in five years. So they were not investigating this case. It was gonna be a cold case and never get solved. One more. One more and then um, we have to end our session, but we'll be more than happy to answer questions Can we do one here? Is that okay? Yes, okay. go for it. So why would William Miller confess to something if he didn't do it? And why, and why did some people confess well, I mean, when I, he didn't do it? Here's the thing. We have to be careful about the word confess because when you hear the word confess, that means something to most of us. Yeah. It means something different in a legal sense to a degree. For instance, when Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. confessed in the uh, West Memphis Three case, he said that he went and retrieved Michael Moore and brought him back to the other assailants. He didn't realize that he was actually confessing to being culpable in the murder. So we don't know exactly what William Miller said. Was he present when she was murdered? Because, and we Jennifer, and you can talk to this, we have uh, theorized, and we, we think we have a pretty good theory, she may have died Sunday night, and there may have been other people in the house. We have been told that there were other people in the house. Yes, and we, and by credible sources. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh-huh. So, as you leave the room today, you're going to hear the song Believe by Brooks and Dunn, and Rebecca's father specifically requested that this song be played for you. 
I have one final message to read you, and I'm going to tell you I've rehearsed this about 30 times, and I can't get through it without my voice ch breaking, so please forgive me in advance. But this is his final message to the audience, and he wants everybody to know how grateful and thankful he is for you attending today. The Brooks and Dunn song helps explain how I maintained my sanity and composure for 16 years. This song represents the inner peace I carry inside me, and I hope it may help others find in, themse find in themselves who have experienced a similar horrific life event. This piece warms my heart and definitely my soul, because although I lost a beautiful daughter in such a violent way, I know I will see her again, hold her again, and I know she is comforted in God's hands. It is this belief that has saved me, and I hope it will save others as well. A murderer took my daughter's life, but I refuse to succumb to this heinous crime, and instead honor Rebecca through my life until I see her again. This is what she would have wanted, so this is what I have done. Thank you, everybody.